Good morning. So I'm uh, Steve Ford. I'm the group product manager for the video and audio products at Adobe. So that means um, I'm responsible for Premiere Pro, After Effects, Audition, and a slew a whole bunch of stuff in between. Um, I like using the Deadpool image because actually Premiere Pro, if for many of you have been in the industry for a while, was not the most predominant nonlinear editor on the planet uh, until about three years ago. And now it is pretty much used in everything. So we've had a really fortunate position of being able to use and listen to and understand where our technology is currently being used um, and some key trends that we see moving forward for the future. Uh, when we were putting this together, it was interesting because uh, last fall, and I like using this image, last fall there was, uh, I think it was uh, Viacom started their numbers release. Uh, Disney put out their numbers at the same time, and I think it was about, media companies lost about $50 billion worth of value in a single day. And this, this image came out in the New York Times the next day, uh, specifically to, to basically state that the ship is sinking, media enterprise, what does the future look like? The main reason why it wasn't just Viacom, although they led the numbers released, Disney followed a few days later. The interesting thing was that essentially nobody could really articulate how their businesses were going to be significantly different um, in, say, 2020. What is a Time Warner or a Viacom or a Disney and so forth going to do in a world where people are on one side changing the revenue path via subscriptions to cable or satellite and so forth, and at the same time, the advertising revenue is going the other way. So it's kind of a perfect storm uh, from that perspective. But what I liked about this image, you know, is it represents, okay, if there's this, the, the original model, the, the main businesses that we understand is the ship, content has never been more predominant than it is today as well. So all of this media is being created at a pace that has never been really recognized before. Um, and at the same time, it's taking off. So it's a real dichotomy overall. I don't think this is gonna be a lot of news to a lot of folks, but I think the interesting thing is, is that when, you know, obviously as, the, the, as I look at it, Adobe, we make the hammer. We make the, the, the tools that people use to create media. And obviously this has a dramatic impact on where we see uh, how users are going to be creating media, media in the future. So we've looked at a couple of key trends, you know, in terms of how this, how this works. Obviously, you know, you go on the show floor of IBC or NAB and you see everybody talking about IP-based stuff and this isn't news to anyone. I mean, everybody's talking about how, is pe how are people going to get access to content? Well, that's predominantly because consumers are consuming that media in different ways than they did before. Um, biggest area that we see a lot of this change in the early stage is with news and sports. Um, the interesting thing, especially with news, how many people actually run to their television set when a major news event is happening? Nobody. Really, everybody just looks at their phone, they go to Google News, they go to a trusted brand, CNN.com, whatever, um, and they, they consume the event that is going on from that perspective. So how does a news organization produce media to meet that demand? Um, that consumption of media on mobile devices, meaning that anybody has multiple devices they can consume on any time they want, uh, means that there has to be an exponential amount of content to meet that demand. So what does that mean for the people who are actually producing the content? A couple of technology trends that we always look at. Um, UHD is not that exciting from my point of view, but HDR is. Um, and mostly because we can see stuff like that in terms of the reaction users have, the reaction that consumers have when they see that type of technology, although it's in its infancy and the standard isn't there yet. Um, there's a lot of hope, I think, for what that could do and what people want to do to create with. Um, and you know, as a result, these are the types of trends that take off. Anybody following VR and all that kind of stuff, it's that social connectivity. People are talking about things in a different way, and really they're the litmus test of why somebody would become an audience of one thing versus another. It's because my peers have told me to go check it out. And that's a very different model you know, than the, the traditional broadcast uh, state of being that was always been in place. And again, this is the big one. This is the big one from a, from a monetary perspective. How do people make money in this environment? The environment is, again, subscribers, cord cutters. That was the big thing that, that, that nailed Viacom. And in fact, uh, yet just yesterday, uh, Viacom put out their numbers again, and uh, that was a bloodbath. Um, mostly because there's not a, how does a media enterprise, which actually has a pretty healthy, steady 
um, state of growth for the next couple of years. State what they will do in an environment where people are binging on Netflix and you know they can get more content that they want on any IP-based service, which is really just a website um, at the end of the day, versus going to something that I will pay X numbers of dollars per month to be a dedicated subscriber to. And at the same time, that coveted demographic for advertising is changing. So that's, these are the big factors that we see um, of why the industry is going through such turmoil. And how does all this relate back to the cloud? Well, again, I think it's, uh, there's a couple of key components to that. So if I, you know, from a, following the money and where this comes from, we look at it from a distribution-centric point of view. Back in the day, sticks on a hill. You basically, I'll use the US example, but it's pretty much the same all over the world. Um, you know, some government organization has said that you are the uh, own, proud owner of a licensing right to be able to broadcast and reach an audience. And you're gonna sell advertisements on that stick on a hill or that satellite connection or um, your cable subscription. And that's how you focused on a 24 hour wheel of content to make sure that you could deliver that audience what they were looking for. And what differentiated you from your competitor was basically a format um, that you decided um, was the best way to reach the audience you chose you were going to You choose the one you would choose to go after. So the interesting thing is, is if you look at it from a, wow, and the font totally got mangled. <laughs> the, uh, the content centric point of view is that th this, th that 24 hour wheel doesn't exist. So where I would focus from a distribution point of view on a single piece of content that would nail a specific audience at a specific time, we don't know what time that is. I'm, you know, and the other day I was up at two in the morning watching stuff on Netflix because I thought it was interesting. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> I don't know why I could sleep. But the interesting thing is, is that when in this environment, the user completely decides. You have no, the consumer chooses what they want to watch, when they want to watch it. And it's been an interesting battle to see how broadcast television has been trying to bring people back and use this on-demand notion as a, as a reference. So if, uh, as an example, um, Walking Dead on AMC. If you, you get an episode of Walking Dead on AMC uh, off of iTunes from Apple and you're watching that on your Apple TV, you'll see an advertisement in the beginning to say, come watch it on Sunday at nine o'clock, which is interesting because then they're also gonna promote three other properties that they have um, in hopes that you will come there. But the reality is a lot of people are watching, I'm, I'm not gonna watch it on Sunday at nine, I'm gonna wait three weeks because I wanna watch three of them in a row. Um, and it's a very different model in terms of consumption. So that content point of view, again, is very different than the distribution point of view that we've had as a business model for a very long time. When we look at the number of people that would be focused on a 24-hour wheel, you could basically say for that singular piece of content, that one thing that you were gonna put out at that specific time for a specific audience, and I'll, I'll pick on Walking Dead just because it's top of mind, 13 episodes, episodic, week after week, you can get, deliver the first one and then you're good until the one you have to deliver the next week. So your entire production process is gonna be oriented around that. How can you deliver each one week over week and so forth? That's a very proven model to be able to come out with a high, high fidelity piece of content that reaches a significant audience um, at that specific point in time. The difference is though is, is that to be able to meet the demands of this world, how many more people do you need to be able to meet that demand. You can't just focus on a single piece of high fidelity content. You have to probably produce X times amount of content at a lower fidelity, potentially. You know, and, and a good example is the folks who can, from a production process point of view, actually meet that demand at high quality. And I would point to things that, that are popular on things like Amazon and Hulu and Netflix like that, like uh, House of Cards, very high fidelity content makes it into 13 episodes in a go, right? So that people can binge it, which is fine, but what, what does it take from a production process to be able to actually deliver that? Um, and that is non-trivial. So the overall message here is, is that as a result of the, the market shifting, there's this exponential demand for content. And as a result, you know, this is a recent trip that we did to uh, a shop in India. So we have a lot of development resources there, and when we decided to go visit some few folks that we saw creating content. Um, the interesting thing is, is that this is a, a, a small shop in, uh, in Noida, which is a suburb of Delhi. 
uh, and you're looking at the whole company right there. They have six million subscribers every week. They reach an average of 20 million views every week. <laughs> um, and that's the production department right there. It's interesting because at the end of the day, they are doing better, you know, in this, and especially to the demographic that they reach, than any TV network that I've ever visited. That's huge. <laughs> And when I look at it from the Facebook point of view as well, 8 billion video views a day. I mean, I know that that's autoplay and all that kind of stuff, and we can discount it somewhat. But at the end of the day, when you look at that amount of content being consumed, you look at that from a reach perspective. And I talked about the cord cutting notion, the 24-hour wheel, and the subscriber for, for broadcast or satellite. And then you come into the scenario where it's like this for advertising. That is a perfect storm from that point of view. So the question is, how do we meet the demand? And overall, you know, really this is what it comes down to. The second, and again, the font. <laughs> See what it does to my next slide. Um, that exponential demand for content is putting um, more pressure uh, on organizations that I've ever seen before. So as an example, I uh, was visiting a broadcaster in Sweden, SVT, the Swedish National Broadcaster. Um, a public broadcaster that is primarily focused on news um, and so forth. Obviously, uh, specific content for their audience, but their biggest investment, I would say, is in news. And they just adopted what they would call a web-first strategy. So in other words, they're a television network that is basically saying, forget television. Television is the secondary property. At the end of the day, what they're going to do is a web-first notion, so they basically have uh, 1,500, just as a reference, they had about 150 editors, you know, scattered around, you know, in edit suites, scattered around different parts of uh, Sweden. Um, and they have 1,500 journalists uh, in different parts, some contracts, some full-time employees, and so forth. The difference is, though, is that they turned around and they said, okay, video journalist, you're now an editor. You have to edit. You actually have to, and this is the use case specifically, you have to be able to, wherever you happen to be for your story, obviously journalists, you're a journalist first and foremost, but at the end of the day, where you're responsible for now shooting it, you're gonna cut it, edit it, you're gonna brand it, make sure the content is representative of SVT, you're gonna clean up the audio, and you're gonna distribute it directly to the web without anybody getting in between. So that con that's the only way that they feel they can compete in an environment from a news perspective in uh, a world where people are going to Google News for, for news. They want their brand, as a trusted brand, to be somewhere that their audience can go to online and can then get their news whenever something specific is happening or whatever they're trying to promote. And then they look at television as a secondary property. So basically, they might find out of the 10 things that were submitted to the web on their website, they might say, okay, uh, those two are interesting, we're gonna put those on television. And so they're editing those 150 editors, we'll take what those 1,500 video journalists did, one of them, and pick the project, embellish it, spice it up, and put it out to their television property and go from there. That's, this is a very different model. Um, they're also saying to those editors that they had from before, uh, that essentially, you gotta do it differently. You can't specialize in the way that you did. So this gets direct, these are all changes in the market, and many of you probably already understand a lot of this stuff. But for us, we make the tools again. We make the software. We make the stuff that people use on their desktops and their mobile devices to make the content. So how does that all play through? This is, this is kind of the, the product positioning pipe that we've looked at um, at Adobe, and this is how we look at the world um, for the most part and how production takes place. And obviously, you can swap out different tools from different vendors in different places here, but at the end of the day, this is what many of us on the software side are trying to achieve. So at the beginning, we, you bring in your media. You, it's shot on something and you have a file-based workflow and you transcode that, you ingest it, you log it, you add metadata to it, and then you start the editorial process. You may then go over to motion graphics and visual effects to embellish it. You add some audio to sweeten it up. You do maybe a color grade, and again, some people do different pieces, some people do all of it, it all depends on the production pipeline. At the end of the day, you're resulting in a file. 
and that file comes out the other side. And what we've tried to do as a software vendor is make sure that we have a product um, all the way along the pipe. And that's essentially why we have our product line that you see from uh, Adobe Creative Cloud today. The other thing is, though, too, is, is that as individuals, most of these folks will identify themselves with one part of that process. Right? I am an editor. I am a motion graphics or visual effects artist. I am an audio engineer. Doesn't work in this new model. Uh, it started when we were talking to uh, media schools. And media schools were you know, focusing on placing interns and so forth at, at different production facilities. And the interesting thing that they started to say was, you're too specialized. You're an editor, but I need you to do motion graphics and audio too. And they would go to the person who's been studying motion graphics and visual effects and say, yeah, but I need you to do editorial. So can you just give me somebody who knows how to do it all? And that's kind of what the demand, going back to, say, as an example for uh, SVT, what I was talking about, the Swedish national broadcaster. They're going to a journalist and say, by the way, you have to edit it, you got to shoot it, you got to you got to brand it, and you got to clean up the audio. And yes, you don't know how to do that. Um, and that's a very different proposition. But again, it's to meet the scale and the demand. So the business drivers within the industry are changing a dramatic requ requirement on this whole construct of how people can conduct the process of making media. So this, this almost unionized approach where you have an individual, and, and by the way, you know, a lot of us, many of us in the software business, have focused on those arrows in between. How do we make sure that the, when projects, as they're collaborating with each other, move from one person to the next, that there's efficiencies there? And again, going back to that 24-hour wheel, when I'm producing that one piece of content that I want the biggest awesome possible audience to come to, I want to make sure I'm doing that as efficiently as possible. That's how I can make sure that I'm making money. So at the end of the day, if I can make sure that I've got things going from log and ingest into editorial and I'm working with my graphics team and so forth, and it all comes together in a fast and streamlined way, that's the best way to make sure that I'm, I have the lowest footprint in terms of cost and I have the highest opportunity for, for profit later on. But the interesting thing is, is again, now what happens in the scenario when it's all one? Basically one user. And, and fun, the funny thing is when I went to that shop in India, and this is something that we've seen across the board, whether we visit creators, the video, the video creators, or the democratized, to uh, keep to the title of the, 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 the presentation, if it's democratized and everybody is going to be doing every component, well, that doesn't mean that they all have the same skill level to be able to do that. Right. So the ironic thing is, is that how do you meet the demand in this new environment? How do we live in an environment where if I look at even back to, uh, and I think this red button goes backwards, uh, let's see, there we go. In this environment, I would say our, from, as the product manager for the product line at Adobe, we don't even meet that. We don't meet this demand in the way that these, this new environment exists. Because at the end of the day, I'm even as you know, somebody who comes from production, I, I used to be the product manager for After Effects. So I know motion graphics and visual effects, but I'm a terrible editor. And audio, I, it's a black art <laughs> to me, which is great, you know, because I know there's a lot of people who really know how to do that stuff too. But now I'm responsible for it all. And it's the only way to scale. It's the only way to turn around and basically say, is again, this uh, YouTube shop that we visited in India, Every time they added somebody to their shop, every time they added somebody to their team, it wasn't to create higher fidelity content. They wanted to create high fidelity content. They would do their best to create the high fidelity content, but for every individual that was added to the team, the expectation was their content output would go up by a factor of one. So if I have three people on my team, three times the content, so forth. And then when we visit a broadcaster like an SVT and they say the exact same thing, we add another person to the production team, the, con the, the output goes up by a factor of one. Um, that's very different. And then we started to see the same thing across the board. So the question is, how do we do it? The overall, you know, and this is the, the part where I have to say that I'm a, at a big public company and I can't tell you. <laughs> but I think if, as from a top of mind point of view, these are the things that we see as, as the primary drivers for the future. Cloud technology, how is that going to integrate people? How do they collaborate in ways that they haven't done before? 
I think um, uh, the notion of a file-based workflow, when you look at devices, devices right now we've been very eccentric on laptops, desktops, and so forth, and we've kind of experimented with things on the phone or on the tablet uh, and that kind of thing. But the interesting thing is, is that at the end of the day, that, you know, what's the difference between a Surface or an iPad Pro and a laptop? It's pretty blurry. Um, and we see that getting even more blurry right down to your device. So the good news is, is that as people are, are trying to meet this demand, we're also seeing a new usage in devices across the board where people are saying that they need to be able to either contribute to the production process or be able to do that process entirely on its own, irrespective of whatever device they happen to be on, wherever they happen to be. So as an example with the video journalist that maybe is doing that news stuff for a broadcaster and is putting stuff to the web first, happens to be just around the corner from a major event that happens. And guess what? The only camera I'm going to have on me is the thing I have in my pocket. And I got to be able to shoot it. And I got to be able to cut it. And I got to be able to brand it. I got to be able to clean up the audio and distribute it all from that device. That is something that we think is critical for the future. And that's probably where you'll be seeing a lot of stuff from us downstream. So with that, again, my name is Steve Ford. I'm the group product manager for products at Adobe. Thank you for having me. Steve, if you stay up real quick, uh, do we have anybody that might uh, have any questions? Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Come on up. Uh, yeah, you have to go to the mic. Just say who, your name and then. Uh, hi, I'm, my name is Todd Pakal. I'm a system integrator here in LA. Um, you mentioned the word union in that path. <laughs> And that struck a chord. Uh, I've worked in a few different places sure. where combining, you know, producer and an editor, you got away with. But you know, the audio guy had to be the audio guy. Do you see? Yeah, I think you know it's an interesting yeah, question. Like and or, the term, I guess, from the the specific cons the idea of using the term unionized is more from the separate role, right? But I think it is an interesting problem when you think about it from a future context. A uh, good example is um, uh, it's more of a North American phenomenon, especially in news. Um, and it's called the predator, right? The producer editor. So one was a producer, one was an editor. Well, now they're both. Um, the same idea is, is it, and, and this is where I think that um, uh, there is an interesting um, change coming, and I don't know how it's completely going to play out, but one thing, I, here's where I have hope for the people who have the skill and have the investment in time and identify themselves as a specialist in a specific domain. When I use all of the environments that I've seen, and pretty much that's my job, I go visit places all over the planet and try to see how people are producing content. And the interesting thing is, is that nobody has basically, there was the producer-editor phenomenon that was, that was about five years ago that I started really seeing that one. Um, that didn't really pan out uh, in the way that I've seen. The video journalist, from that point of view, is being added, is in addition to, is not replacing. Um, because again, this is the, the other part of the story is, is that there has never been a higher demand for video content in human history than there is now. So that's a good thing. The difference is, is though, is, is that means that instead of trying to find roles to find new efficiencies, which is what I think that producer-editor scenario was. It's how the heck do you meet that demand scenario so new pipelines and processes are being invented as a result. So I don't think it's necessarily about um, uh, replacing uh, from that side. So I think it, there's going to be a transition. At the same time, you know, it just is an interesting stat, and I'll, I'll go from the motion graphics point of view. Um, we see users spending less and less time in a product that, that you know, if I was to model five years ago After Effects, um, uh, people would spend 10 hours a day, right? Um, now they're spending five hours a month, you know? And the main reason why, we've seen that trend go like this way, but we've also seen in Premiere Pro, the editorial experience, it go up like a rocket. And then we find that it's those same users, the ones that were in After Effects, they're having to do the editorial content themselves. And they can only go to After Effects to do motion graphics and visual effects when they have time. Right? Or when there's, there's the demand, but good enough mostly is, because when I got to do eight times the content than I did before, and by the way, the budgets don't change. So, <laughs> you know, I think the, the key thing is, is that um, uh, it's an addition to for a lot of these folks. Uh, but it is an interesting question for the new folks that are entering the market. What domain do I specialize in? What 
skill set, what differentiation do I have uh, as an individual? So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be, it remains to be seen. We'll have time for one more question and then. Sure. Talked about making hammers, and Adobe makes great hammers. Thank you. But as my grandfather uh, used to say, uh, a hammer doesn't make you a carpenter. That's right. <laughs> it's absolutely correct. So, um, with this uh, trend towards one person does everything, we have all slowly been uh, lowering our bar relative to quality. Yep. Um, and now I've noticed in the last year or two that that trend has now made its way from the web into national news, for example. Yep. And you've got uh, out of sync reports. You've got vastly mismatched EQ between the stand up portion and the, the voiceover portion. Yep. You've got color all over the place, shot to shot. Um, and we, you know, we're just kind of starting to accept it, but it's kind of a shame. What I think would be nice to see, and maybe this is in what you're not allowed to talk about, but the idea that can we use the tools to take care of some of those um, those mechanical things? Yes. Can the software help us make sure that if it's clear in the picture analysis, pattern recognition, that that worst person just said the word but, but the sound is starting eight frames later, that we can point that out and help it? Can we look at the color balance in, in the pictures and go, are you sure you want to publish this because yep. you're all over the map? Um, the EQ of your of that same person from shot to shot is all over the map. Can yep. we use those things to help people who don't have those acuities? They're great journalists. That doesn't mean they have great visual acuity. Bingo. So, okay. yeah. yeah, I think you're so, you're. Can hit you talk about that? Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's you're spot on. Um, you know, obviously, I, I this is where it gets into the fuzzy territory of being able to say what we're doing as a roadmap and what's going to show up in which products, big public company, and that all that business. But the interesting thing is is that, you know, and I would look at this from a time perspective, when we went from tape-based workflows to file-based workflows, and when we went through, you know, that specialization of your craft, I am an editor, and I'm going to understand every component of editing to produce the highest fidelity content. As a software vendor that providing that technology, we focused on infinite flexibility, right? We wanted to be able to say, you as the user can decide how you're going to tweak and press every button and every dial in any way that you want to form to create that content as a person who is not going to go to that degree of specialization, you can infinitely hang yourself. <laughs> and that's where you get into those problems, right? So the interesting thing is, is that um, uh, what we've been hearing loud and clear from our customers, if you look at a, a product like Premiere Pro, way too heavy for that environment. If you look at the video journalist scenario, you know, we've heard from customers where they're saying, we want something on a mobile device, we also want it to deal with loudness and white balance and all that kind of stuff, automatically, right? Because they're just not going to even spend the time to learn what that means, let alone really make sure that they've done it correctly. Uh, they also, you know, need, again, it's about scale. So if you have 1,500 video journalists out and there's maybe just a button that takes care of that, right? Um, and then it goes to broadcast to an editor that has that specialization. They don't want that, the capability to tweak taken away from them, right? So how do you transfer the stuff that, say, somebody has worked and it's just a single button and it's coming over here because we've taken care of it from the technology point of view, but we also still can't figure out what your intent is, right? So we want to give you the flexibility, and that's the perfect marriage from our point of view. But you're, uh, you're spot on. I think that the things that you're going to see from us in the future are focused on guided workflows, templating workflows, right? So that basically if I work in an organization that has a standard color profile, I'm just picking one out of the air, but, and that's the way that the look that we've decided as a broadcast standard, or this is our standard lower third that has a, you know, an animated graphic and so forth on it. How do you make that accessible to that person who's standing at the event with their mobile phone and the thing that they're actually shooting is credible enough and also make them go landscape, not portrait, yeah. um, you know, that kind of stuff to make sure that those things actually happen. Um, uh, I think that's, and it's not just going to be from us. I think that the, the landscape you're going to see from technology vendors supporting production processes are all going to come around this. And this is where, I, going back to the nomenclature for this specific event, how does all that synchronize? How does all that come together? You know, whether that's enterprise media asset management, whether that's collaboration systems, all of those things have to be linked. And it's not necessarily going to be the feature functionality of the tool. 
it's going to be how they all interconnect with each other. Uh, that's going to be the deciding factor whether they can actually meet the demand. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.